uh, Zoom, but they can access YouTube. So we're going to get this going live on YouTube. So give me one second here. Oh, my God. The great Lauren Fox is here. Whoa. Then we're going to uh, record on this computer. Awesome. Uh, Zoom. So fantastic. So we are live here with uh, Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program sponsored by Fundraising University. And I want to welcome everyone to the Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program. And we'd like to take the time to say thank you to any current Fundraising University coaches or administrators joining us on the call today. And Fundraising University, as we know, is the top high school fundraising company in the United States, helping to raise over $150 million for programs since its inception in 2009. And and super excited about our guest tonight, Dr. Rob Gilbert. He's the creator of Success Hotline, which has been inspiring and impacting people who are, have big goals all over the world since January 22nd, 1992. It's a three-minute message that was on an answering machine, and we've put the phone number in the chat, 973-743-4690. Dr. Gilbert's the only phone number I know in the world besides my wife's and my own. And I first heard Dr. Gilbert speak at the Sheridan Hotel in Burlington, Vermont, March 2006. It was a student athlete at leadership conference. I was an athletic director and attended that event. And for 90 minutes, I went on a ride like I had never seen or heard a speaker or a teacher move an audience. You laughed, you cried, you were dancing, trying to outdance uh, other people in the room. And at the end of his 90 minute presentation, I said, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. I went up and book that was uh, had a paper clip on it. It wasn't even a book. It was just it was the papers from the book. And he said, "Hey, I want you to read this." And it was the book. If you want to win tomorrow, read this book tonight. And I put a link link to that on Amazon. It's it's one of the best books I've ever read. And I'm honored to bring a mentor of mine, um, a guy who's had more impact on my life than anybody. Dr. Rob Gilbert. Thanks for being with us, Doc. Glad you're here on Coaching Matters. I mean, where's Carolyn? She's trying in another room. I should bring her on, though. <laughs> okay. So I'm glad, so glad you're here, Doc. So the whole purpose of me being here and the whole, you know, if I do a good job, there's something we're going to talk about tonight that you're going to use tomorrow with your people. I mean, if I don't give you stuff to use tomorrow, I don't get off this. Uh, there has to be a story. There has to be a game. There has to be something that has to change as a result of being here. So, um, and I'll give you a little break. If you don't use something, any seminar you go to, if you don't use the information within the next 24 to 48 hours, the truth of the matter is you're not going to. If you read a book and you don't put it into uh play in the next 24 to 48 hours you're just kidding yourself you probably never ever will so should we start with the uh one word that explains it all yeah i think that would be great okay so um i've been studying peak performance and sports psychology for more than 50 years and then i had an experience 12 years ago that all of a sudden everything i knew claps to one word just claps to one word and we'll get to the word. But let me tell you what promoted this word. It was December uh, about 12 years ago, a rainy, wet, cold December day. And I'm driving down to a place called Hamilton High School in Hamilton, New Jersey, uh, because I want to see one of my heroes. Now, it's strange to have a hero that's your age, but that's how great a wrestler Dan Gable was. Uh, he was wrestling when I was wrestling. He won everything. I won nothing. And he's giving a talk. And after his talk, everybody wants him to sign their Dan Gable wrestling shoes or take a selfie with the Olympic champion, Dan Gable. To show you, he wasn't just an Olympic champion. He wasn't scored on in the Olympics. That's like throwing three no-hitters in the World Series, not getting a point scored upon you. So I waited for everybody to leave the gym. And Dan's there with the organizers. And I approach him. I said, Dan, he doesn't know me. I said, Dan, can I ask you a rather strange question? And he said, you can ask me anything you want. And, you know, he's a very, very sweet, kind man. I said, how come you won everything in wrestling and I won nothing? And he said, where'd you go to school? And I said, I went to UMass Amherst. And he said, I went to Iowa State. Like, I didn't know that. He said, what time of day did you practice? And I said, yeah, 4 to 6.15, 4 to 6.30. He said, yeah, we did too. 
He said, what did your coach have you do at the towards the end of practice? I said, we'd do 15 or 20 minutes of conditioning. He said, yeah, we did too. He said, what did you do when practice was over? I said, well, to tell you the truth, Dan, I was so exhausted. I crawled back to my locker. I took a shower. I got dressed and I went to get something to eat. He said, no, no, that's not what I did. He said, I went back to my locker too, but I put on a rubber suit. I put on a hoodie. I put on sweatpants and I got my jump rope and I went back into the wrestling room and I jumped rope until I passed out. Now, you know what cartoons are? where you see a person's head, then you see balloons above the head, like what they're thinking. The moment he said that was a crucial moment in my sports psychology career, because all of a sudden I saw two things, two balloons. One, Rob Gilbert eating a pork chop in the dining commons, and the other one, Dan Gable jumping rope like a maniac. And all of a sudden, now by the way, he never passed out. He was in such great shape, he tried to pass, he couldn't pass out. In the 72 pre-Olympic issue of Sports Illustrated, Sports Illustrated said he was the best conditioned athlete in the world. That's how he was unscored upon. So that's when I became intimately associated and passionate about my whole sports psychology career from that day has been about one word. And the one word is extreme. You have to be extreme. If you want to be great in the area of peak performance, you have to be extreme. If you want to be um, a great anything, you have to be extreme. Everything comes down to extreme. You pick any athlete and you tell me how great they are and they're extreme. You know, Jerry Rice, just check out the hill. Ray Lewis, you know, check out, uh, you know, uh, chess players. They're all extreme. Uh, The Queen's Gambit, she was extreme, you know, tragically extreme uh you know self-destructively extreme but she was extreme so you have to be extreme so let's take the extreme test right now uh what i'd like you to do could everybody unmute themselves and uh, what i'd like you to do on the count of three what i'd like you to do on the count of three when i say three i want you to clap your hands as loud as you can okay ready one three okay Okay. So now, no matter how hard you clap your hands, I bet you could clap your hands 10 times harder. So what I'd like you to do now is to clap your hands, clap your hands 10 times harder. Ready? One, two, three, clap. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about extreme. Okay. You can, you, you can mute yourself. You can mute yourself. Well, Dr. Gilbert, now you're muted. Let me ask you a question. Are you a whisper or are you a shout? Am I unmuted now? Yeah, oh, you're good, yeah. Whisper oh, or by shout. By the way, could you, could you make me the co-host, Brian? I can. You, okay. So are you a whisper or are you a shout? I could have done the same thing with the slap or the clap. I mean, I could have done, you could have stomped or you could have slammed your leg. So you you got to get, people have to have the idea that they're not even coming close. They think they're shouting and they're whispering. They think they're really clapping loud and they're clapping. So see, people don't believe what you say. They do believe what they do. So I've done this enough times. So, so when I say, okay, I want you to clap as hard as you can. People go, you know, if I say clap 10 times harder and then you can reach your hand as high as you can. Now reach it a quarter inch higher. Everybody in 40 years, every single person has reached their hand a quarter inch higher. Every single person. So that's what's so much fun about sports psychology. We don't need, you know, we don't need these fancy ergonomic machines. You know, we don't need concept two rowers. Most people are blocking their own mind. You know, your performance equals your potential minus interference. Your performance equals your potential minus interference. That comes from the probably the greatest sports psychology book ever written, The Inner Game of Tennis. And our job is to take the big interference to the little interference. So when I do um, my workshops and I say, okay, uh, you know, um, what I want you to do is clap your hands as hard as you can. And then I say, clap them 10 times harder. Well, what just happened? The first time I asked you to do it as hard as you can, how come you were able to do it 10 times harder? Because you were so worried about WWOPT and WWOPS. 
what will other people think and what will other people say? You know, so we are our own biggest enemy. We are our own biggest uh, opponent and we get on our own way all the time. So now you're probably saying, okay, Gilbert, uh, let, let's let's talk about extreme. Am I uh, unmuted? I mean, am I, am I co-host? You are, yes. Okay, so let me see if I could show you. You know, you this is, uh, let me let me see if I could show you somebody who um, I think uh, is pretty extreme. R C H E R. You know, this yeah, guy makes real- this guy. So make sure you're. The day started with a big win for Team Canada. Is playing, Brian? Yes. Yep. The sound's on? Yeah. The day yeah, started. Notice how he didn't say he wanted to win the Paralympics. He wants to win it all. He wants to be the best archer in the world. So when I saw that on CBS Sunday morning, they have a longer version. And so I got myself a bow. Yes, and uh, cash, whatever, and however, First thing I had to get, I had to get rubber chip because one day I shot my cat, which didn't work out too well. So, you know, I've been practicing with my bow and arrow and you notice how there's a bow and there's a drawstring and the arrow and you you, just, you shoot it. And I realized I was not gonna be even better than the guy with no arms. So um, I thought, what could I do? How could I be extreme? How could I do a demonstration? How could I impress Lauren Fox? Um, and I got a real arrow. This is a real, real arrow. So what Matt is, Matt, he shoots externally. His target's out outside, you know? His target, he has the traverse distance. I said, what if I become the world's best internal archer? Rather than going for, uh, you know, something outside 50 miles away, what if I, go for something internal like what if my bullseye was my esophagus and i've been practicing i'm pretty extreme in doing this and i've gotten 120 bullseyes with my esophagus now you're probably saying what's this guy talking about so i'll show you so this is a real arrow no uh and this is one of these fancy drawstrings Okay. And and don't do this at don't do this at home. Wait till you go to school to do it. Okay? Brian, can people see me? Yes. Okay. Do you see where the arrow is? Uh, I can see the arrow in the neck, but but don't see the other side. Okay, well, what do we have to do? How do I make maybe, my maybe if you back up a little bit? There we go. There we go. That better? Ye- yes. Yes? Yes. Maybe you could spotlight me or something if you could do uh, that. You are you are spotlighted. We see the, the tip of the arrow looks like you have a rope around it and you're about to pull that into your neck. Oh. Uh. Oh. <laughs> oh no 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 hold your applause hold your applause hold your applause so uh let's see who do i know here uh martin is that extreme enough for you or you want something more extreme oh you guys can unmute yourself now so if you want to answer that martin okay well when i'm taking martin uh martin wants something more extreme so we'll come back to doing something more extreme so that's what we're talking about. You got to be extreme. Now, there are two types of extreme. You have to be extreme like one of my favorite football coaches in the country um, is a coach at Ridgewood High School, Chuck Johnson, Ridgewood High School. I think this guy is in his late 60s. He almost died two years ago. He got some serious infection, not COVID. He died almost before COVID. I think every day he's in his weight room at 630 in the morning. I mean, he's a guy that's been coaching for 40 years. You know, he has tenure. He wins all the time. He's there every single day. What do you think happens? 
if if a, if the kids see how extreme he is, they say, "Hey, if coaches if coaches showing up, I got to show up." So you got to be extreme in just in your physical measures. Like Brian used to when I first met him, he was a fat blob, weren't you? And now yeah. you're uh, what's your percent body fat? Like eight percent. Uh, so yeah, not quite, probably ten. Yeah. So you got to be a product of the product, but you also have to be obsessed with getting the best information, the best techniques, going anywhere, speaking to anybody about anything. So does everybody have a pen and a piece of paper? Yes? If you don't have we a pen get and a piece of paper, get a pen and a piece of paper, okay? We can get it. And Dr. Gilbert, where they're getting that, I'm just going to take a minute to, uh, to once again, I'd like to recognize our, our fundraising university. I'd like to recognize them and their owner, Mike Bahoon, as the official sponsor for the Coaching Matters group coaching program. And uh, if you take a look inside of the chat, we're going to post a link here to where you can get more information about being a potential franchise owner or a corporate rep or joining us as an ambassador coach to continue to influence and impact and make an income with coaching. Dr. Gilbert, back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think one of the best baseball players in, in New Hampshire just showed up. I'm not sure. But um, so here's what I want you to do. I wanted to play a little game with you. I want you to make believe that you've been recruited. People have been checking you out and you've been recruited to try out for a super selective military intelligence force. It's much like the Navy SEALs. It's much like the Army Rangers, but it's secretive. People don't know about this. So they fly you out to San Diego and they give you five days of physical tests, the most rigorous physical testing anybody's ever done anywhere. They test you on land, on the sea, underwater, overwater, jumping jacks, pull-ups, push-ups, diving underwater, holding your breath, running a marathon, running with somebody on your back. You think about it, they had you do it. And at the end of the five days, the woman that's in charge, she said, Bruno, you have the best scores we have ever seen recorded. Now we have to give you the psychological test. And you say, psychological test? I'm exhausted. He said, Bruno, it's only going to take 20 seconds. And you say, oh, okay, I could do 20 seconds. So here's the test. You got to get your pen and paper out. I'm going to count from five to four to three to two to one, and I'll say start. Then I'll say five, four, three, two, one, stop. The whole psychological test that will get you into this super selective military intelligence group is this. In 20 seconds, you have to draw as many triangles as you can. Where are my triangles? You have to draw as many triangles as you can. Okay, um, my triangles? Yeah. Okay, now, since the only thing that matters is how pretty, the uh, prettiness doesn't matter. It just matters that you draw. The, so don't draw big triangles, draw little triangles, okay? So I'll say five, four, three, two, one. So you gotta draw as many as you can. So I'll say five, four, three, two, one, start. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, start. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Now, count how many triangles you drew, put it in the top of your paper, the number of the top of your paper, and put a little circle around it. And then, as quick as you can, go into the chat and put how many triangles you drew in the chat. Okay? So, really quickly, everybody put the chat. Okay, Ed got 25. We got 20. We got 32. Alex, we got 23. We got 20. We got 31. We got 220. What is that? Do you know this guy, Charlie Smith? Give him a, a, he has to be tested for steroids. 26. Saturday. I know. 31. Okay. So these are pretty typical scores for, okay. So then the woman in charge says, Bruno, how many do you get since I'm using you as an example? I don't see Bruno's score here. Bruno was so, 120, I think. Bruno got 125. Okay. So we'll say, um, uh you know brett brett ashley davis okay she got 32. and the woman in charge says brett i i hate to tell you this um 32 is well above average but um 
the minimum passing score is 80. And you say 80, uh, 80 is impossible. And they say, look at, you're tired. Here's what we're gonna do. You're such a good candidate. We're gonna fly you home. I want you to stay home for a week. Then you could rest for a week and then come back and we'll retest you just the psychological part. And that seemed fair enough, fair enough. So when you get home, you tell your family and friends and they're all ears and they say, oh, what you need to do is, Brett, you need to get a lighter pen or you gotta draw smaller triangles. So you have to practice eight hours a day or you have to do it. And you realize it's all, they're giving you bad advice. And then you're having dinner with one of your best friends and you're telling him the problem. And he said, you know, you know, I went to MIT. My roommate at MIT was a genius and they recruited him for the same thing they re recruited you for. And the same thing happened to him. He took the, psych the, the physical test and he scored super high. And then the psychological test, he bombed out. But this guy was a genius and he was also a pit bull. He said, if the minimum passing score is 80, there must be, I'm going to crack the code on how to do this. So he stayed up three days and three nights, and finally it came to him. He figured out how to do it because it's impossible to draw 80 triangles in 20 seconds. But it's very possible to draw 20 five-pointed stars. So if you look at the five-pointed stars, what do the five-pointed stars have in them? They have five triangles. You see the five triangles? So here's what I'd like you to do now, is just take a few seconds and practice drawing five-pointed stars. And once again, draw tiny five-pointed stars. Don't draw these big five-pointed stars. So if you could draw one five-pointed star a second for 20 seconds, that's 20 five-pointed stars times five, that's 100. You, you pass with flying colors. So this is crucial. The rest of your life depends on this. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody from Iowa have any questions? Okay. 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 So I'm going to do the five, the same thing. Five pointed stars. You got to draw at least one a second for 20 seconds. Okay. So ready. Five, four, three, two, one, start. Go for it. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Okay, now count the number of stars and multiply it by five and put that at the top of your, uh, at the top of your paper. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is in the chat, put how many you got the first time, and how many you got the second time? So put 31 slash 120 or whatever you got. So put what you got the first time and what you got the second time. So put in the chat right now. Okay, so Marty went from 120. Okay, 26 to 100, 45 to 145, 32 to 115, 31 to 115. 20 to 115, 31 to 130, 23. Okay, so let's take Cecil. So suppose Cecil, the first time he got 20, and the second time he got 120. That's a 600% improvement. So imagine you go to the gym every day and you bench press, you know, 200 pounds every day. And then after you meet with a performance expert like Brian Kane, the next time you go to the gym, you have a 600% improvement. You bench press 1,200 pounds. You'd stop everybody in the gym and they'd all come over and say, what happened to him? So one of the most exciting things in our field is knowing the difference between improvement and breakthrough. Going from a tricycle to a bicycle is an improvement. Going from a bicycle to a motorcycle, that's a breakthrough. Going from a, you don't even know what this is. This is a cassette tape. Going from a cassette tape to a CD is an improvement. Going from a CD to Netflix is a breakthrough. There is only one person alive today that deserves to be called a genius. The only person alive today, everybody, everybody has improved their sport. 
is Michael Jordan a basketball genius? No, he's a he, he's improved basketball. You know, his Tom Brady changed basketball, uh, base uh, football. No. So let me show you the only person alive today that's a genius because he didn't improve his sport. He created a breakthrough in his sport. So let me show you who he is. And learn everything you can about this guy. So make sure this is 68. Every men's Olympic champion that won a gold medal has done the Fosbury flop. So we have to start thinking about not just getting better, but improving. You know, going from 200 pounds to 185 pounds, you know, that, that might be an improvement. But going from 600, 600 to 185, that's a breakthrough. So we start thinking about breakthroughs. So let me tell you about somebody um, way back at 5, he was born in 550 BC, and he lived on an island off of Greece called Croton, C-R-O-T-O-N. And he wanted to be a great Olympic wrestling champion. But he was a little kid and he wasn't that strong. So one day there was a little calf born and this guy was a genius, just like Fosbury. So he said, daddy, would it, would it hurt the calf if I put the calf around my neck and walked around the farm? He said, no, go ahead. So he cleaned off the calf, put it around his neck, walked around the farm. Next day, cleaned off the calf, walked around the farm. Next day, next day, next day. So every single day, the calf got bigger. And every single day, Milo, his name was, got stronger. He invented progressive resistance exercise. And no matter what you have, kettlebells or, you know, you, you, you could have, uh, uh, no matter what kind of machines you have, they haven't improved on it yet. I mean, this little kid in Greece figured it out. Along the way, he won four ancient Olympic uh, gold medals. So that's what we're talking about. We have to stop thinking about breakthroughs, stop thinking about four minute miles. I mean, the four minute mile has an unbelievable story. While, and this is a true story because Bannister, I, I went to a talk he gave and he told the story. He went through a horrible, horrible experience. In 1952 at the Olympics, he was a pride of England and he was supposed to win the gold medal. He didn't win any medal. And he's in medical school and he realizes he can't hang on till 1956. So what he decided is he had to break the four minute mile. This is the most amazing sports training story ever. So as you know, medical schools do not have track teams. So every single day, what's medical school? You go to school from eight to five and you study all night. That's medical school for four years. So. Every single day, he cut a different class. He met his college track coach, and he trained. Now, here's the most amazing sports performance story ever. He never trained for four, more than 40 to 45 minutes a day. At the same time, there was a guy in Kansas named Wes Santee that 24-7, he had massage people, exercise physiology. All he was doing was training to break the four-minute mile, and there was a guy in Australia doing the same thing. And... In May 1954, May 13th, I think it was, Bannister did it, training 40 to 45 minutes a day. So that's, it's not how much time you put in, it's what you put into the time. So Bannister was a sports genius. Uh, Dick Fosby was a sports genius. And you have to start thinking like, you are going to figure out. See, right now, we know the, we, we, we know better techniques in peak performance. We know better techniques in nutrition. We know better techniques in mental training, but we don't know the best. The best techniques have not been invented yet. Somebody was onto something. Somebody was onto something. And if you're in my age, you remember what CyberVision was, but I bet, I bet nobody out there knows what CyberVision is. Put, up a, put a hand up if you know what CyberVision is. CyberVision, I think, is the biggest sports psychology breakthrough of all time but I don't think anybody knows what it is anymore. So start figuring out what CyberVision is. CyberVision was on to a breakthrough in sports psychology. Okay, so we're not talking about improvement, we're talking about breakthrough. I don't care if, if somebody says, well, Dr. Gilbert, could you help me improve? No, <laughs> I don't wanna, I don't have enough time with that. You know, like I tell my students the first day of class, I said, what's your goal? Oh, I wanna graduate, what's your goal? Uh, I want to get into medical school. What's your goal? I want to become an occupational therapist. I said, boring, boring, boring. 
your goal should be win a Rhodes Scholarship. Figure out what a Rhodes Scholarship. That's exciting. Graduating with honors, who cares? Winning a Rhodes Scholarship, only 34 people win one a year. As a matter of fact, the person who won the Rhodes Scholarship calls my hotline to this day. His name is, uh, oh, what was his name? His name was Booker. He was a football player from Bergen County, New Jersey. Booker. You might know him now because his name is Cory Booker. Senator Cory Booker, presidential candidate Cory Booker calls Success Hotline. My students don't call Success Hotline, but Cory Booker calls Success Hotline. So maybe there's something to it. Okay, so anybody have any questions, comments, ideas, opinions, cynical remarks, anything you want to talk about? Uh, Dr. Gilbert, we had a couple of questions that came in from the chat, yeah. um, and I'll, I'll go back through those here. One of the questions was, what, what, what time of day do you post Success Hotline, and how have you been so motivated to do it every day since, since 2000, or 1992? Well, my goal, not on weekends, but my goal is to, to do it by, by uh, 7.30 East Coast time in the morning, but sometimes I meet the goal and sometimes I, I don't meet the goal. Uh, I have no idea when Ironclad puts it up because I don't follow Ironclad at all on the, on the podcast. I appreciate what they're doing for me, but I don't know when they when they put it up. But uh, every day there will be a message. I can't, and I try to do it by seven thirty in the morning. And what motivates me to do it? Um, it has been the mo- one most important thing I've done in my life. So how Success Hotline started? I was teaching my applied sports psychology class. Uh, in the spring semester 1992. And all of a sudden I had this revelation. I said, when I was a high school wrestling coach, I would see my kids five, six, seven times a week. And now I'm teaching coaches and administrators in sports psychology and I see them once a week. I said, well, what happened? You know, when you get to be my age and you work out once a week, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna have a heart attack. You don't work out once a week. So I decided, well, Maybe I'll do a message and put on a, an answering machine for the next 14 weeks. That how, that's how long a semester is. So I started doing that, and it was 98 messages. And by the time I got to message number 98, I had so many people calling from all over the country, I decided never to stop. And my whole motivation is is very, very selfish. I mean, because my job is to motivate my students. And how can I motivate my students unless I'm motivated? It's like if I want to if I want to be a, human, a humanitarian and I want to give away money, it, it's kind of important that I have money. Well, guess what? I don't have money, but I do have motivation. And doing my hotline motivates me every day. So you might think I'm talking to you, but I'm really talking to me. I'm motivating myself, and I've never gotten off my hotline messages feeling less. You know. If on a scale of one to 10, when I do the message, if I'm a two, I'll get off the, you know, I'll be a four. But usually I'm like a seven or eight. I'm usually a nine or 10. So I'm, I'm suggesting you do your own hotline. You write your own messages. You put it on your own answering machine. Because, you know, the one of the big mistakes we make is we have this little voice in our mind and we have a choice. Are you going to listen to the voice or are you going to talk to the voice? When I'm doing my hotline message, I'm talking to myself. So we have to train athletes to talk to themselves more and listen to themselves less. And I realize I'm going over a lot of principles really, really, really quickly. But the great thing about sports psychology, it's unbelievably powerful. Do you know how big sports psychology is going to be 50 years from now? It's going to be what weight training is now. You know what weight training was 50 years ago? They told baseball players not to lift weights. Do you know that, Brian? They yeah, said, you'll get, get muscle, muscle bound. bound. Yeah, you'll get yeah. muscle bound. And then number eight for the Boston Red Sox changed that. Who is that? Lauren, you got to help me out. Who is number eight? Kyle yes. Yastrzemski. Kyle Yastrzemski, yeah. before he won the Triple Crown one year, he got something called a personal trainer. On top of that, personal trainers were like for horses. And he started lifting. He won the Triple Crown. You know, they let him go in left field where Ted Williams used to be. So all of a sudden, this is what sports psychology is nowhere now compared to what it's going to be. And we got to be the people to take it. How we talk to ourselves, the goals we set, you've got to be outrageous. So 
you're not going to sell extreme to your clients and your your athletes unless you're extreme and extreme could just be they see you working out every day they see you losing weight they see you doing crazy stuff and they'll call it crazy but they'll really really impress you so people will not believe anything you say they'll only believe what you do and what they do and when you can get them to do things they've never done before then they'll become a believer okay any more questions uh other other question comes says biggest lessons that you have learned as a sports psychologist well the biggest lesson i've learned in my life is when i was growing up in brighton massachusetts i wanted to be the third baseman you know, I was sure when Frank Melzone retired, I was going to be the next third baseman for the Red Sox. Meanwhile, there was another guy in Swampscott that lived my dream. His name was Tony Canigliaro. And um, I never made it to the Red Sox. I mean, uh, I never made it anywhere. And I went through my whole high school and college career thinking that, you know, Tony Conigliaro was born. By the way, Tony Conigliaro in the history of baseball was the first, he, he, he reached 100 home runs earlier than anybody in the history of baseball. So imagine going from Swamp Scott High School to Fenway Park and your first at bat in the major leagues, you hit a home run. Imagine playing in your brother, you're in uh, left field and your brother's in center field. So anyway, I was pretty convinced that Tony Canigliaro was born with talent and I wasn't. And then I came to realize that it wasn't, he was born, he was trained. His father was taking him to two or three or four games a day and my father wasn't taking me anywhere, you know? He had a batting coach way back in, in 1961 and I surely didn't. So I'm not making fun of my father. I'm just saying you could be trained to do anything. So I went from thinking, you know, I, I went from thinking it was a given a given ability to a trained skill. And now I believe anything, whether you want to become a chess master or a memory master, or you want to do a 500 pound bench press, it's all a trained strategy. On my uh, tombstone is going to be the word training. I think that's the most exciting word in the world that any. So I, I hope you realize when we did the thing with the, the triangles, the triangles to the stars, we should have spent five hours on that, by the way uh but we only spent five minutes on it and that is a metaphor for what is possible you didn't just improve you had a breakthrough in a matter of seconds because i gave you a better strategy could you have figured out that strategy on your own probably it might have taken you a few years but why as long as there's an expert why figure it on your own when somebody else has already figured it out why put the filaments in the light bulb together when you could buy a light bulb so that's why I think you should spend a lot of money finding expert trainers. I think there are certain yeah. things you should you should have that are expert in your life. I think you should have a great dentist. I think you should have a great therapist. And I think you should find the best speakers in the world and the best trainers in the world and pay for them to train you to do what they do. You know, or you could just keep doing your old same old stuff over and over again and be boring like everybody else in the world is. We're not lacking for any boring teachers and boring trainers in this world today. You got to be on fire. You know, if it, Mr. Resnick taught me Shakespeare in the 10th grade. I haven't read Shakespeare since the 10th grade because Mr. Resnick wasn't excited about Shakespeare. See, my goal is, see, I never read Shakespeare other than when he assigned it. My goal is if I tell you something and you start using it and start reading about it and start calling my hotline, then I made a difference. And so if I don't make a difference, it's a total waste. John F. Kennedy said, if you're giving a speech, the purpose of, the purpose of giving a speech is to change the world. So I don't think I'm gonna change the world, but I do think every time I walk into a class, I could change a kid's life. And guess what? Back in um, the late 1980s, I was doing a workshop called the Winner's Workshop and a kid from Bergen County, New Jersey, came to my workshop and I changed his life. And he might change the world because his name's Cory Booker and he might be president. To this day, Cory Booker uses stuff like the stuff, get your hand as high as you can, get a quarter inch higher. He still uses that in his talks. So in a way, I think I made a difference in his life and he might make a difference in the country's life and the world's life, who knows?
But that's the goal. See, I, I believe I'm changing people's lives, but I don't have too much proof. But it only matters. Here's the most important thing about speaking. Whether you're speaking about sports psychology or kettlebells, the important thing is, well, let's look at it this way. Suppose you move, move to a new town and you don't know anybody in the town and you know, you're really, really religious and you want to start going to church. So you start going to different churches every Sunday. And what are you looking for? You're looking for a minister about when they talk about God, you believe that they believe. So I show my students videos of T.D. Jakes. When I show my students T.D. Jakes, I said, listen closely. I'm not asking you whether you believe in God. After I show you this video, I want you to believe, I want to know whether you believe he believes. So the only way I evaluate my classes is every once in a while, I say, okay, rate me on a scale of one to 10. This is to my students. And you totally believe that I believe in one, you don't believe I believe. And you could pick anything in between. And if I don't get all nines and tens, I'm gonna retire. Because I don't care if my students like me. I don't care if my students really, you know, understand what I'm talking about. The most important thing is they have to believe you believe. And if they don't believe you believe, the game is over. It's over because why should they possibly listen to you? So Mr. Resnick, I don't he even I didn't believe that he believed that Shakespeare was the greatest writer in the history of the English language. The whole rest of the world believed that Shakespeare was the greatest writer in in, in the English language. But Mr. Resnick didn't believe it. Hmm. You so know, Dr. Do your audiences do your audiences believe that you believe? Whether you're teaching math or whether you're counseling them or whether you're, you know, doing mental performance. They have to believe you believe. And if you're not studying mental performance every day, you really don't believe. You know, there's a basketball coach from the former men's coach at Stanford University. And he was once quoted as saying, I shouldn't have a driver's license. They shouldn't let me drive because all I ever think of all day is, bas uh, is volleyball. All I ever think of. So let me give you the definition of sports psychology. Kyle Yastrzemski said this. He said, I think about baseball all day. I dream about baseball all night. No, I, I think about baseball as soon as I wake up in the morning. I think about baseball all day. I dream about baseball all night. The only time I don't think about baseball is when I'm playing it. That's what sports psychology is all about. Okay, anything else? Uh, Dr. Gilbert, one of the, one of the questions, uh, yeah, and something that you've talked a lot about is that you don't want success hotline to be thought provoking. Yeah. Would you, would you kind of unpack that? And for all the people that are on the call that if you, if you, yeah. if you, I know you're, you're, they're frantically taking notes, I can see them writing things down. Just yeah. make sure that after today you are on success hotline every day. I've posted links to it inside of the chat. I'm going to post those again here as well as uh, Dr. Gilbert. Would you prefer that they, they go to the podcast on Ironclad or call or does it not matter? Uh, well, uh, whatever you want to do is fine with me. But okay. the thing is, um, I, I don't want to come across as an egomaniac, but I'm really, really nuts. I really am. I mean, I see myself as a prospector looking for nuggets. Now, let me prove to you how nuts I am. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of old Amway tapes that I listen to just looking for a nugget. And I got one yesterday. A guy named Burke Gulick said, you know, there are two types of people you don't want to take advice from. Number one, everybody. And number two, nobody. You don't want to take advice from everybody. And I, ju I just love it when I find one of those nuggets. But one of the things I'm going to share with you that I haven't really unpacked yet is I've come up with the best way to sell sports psychology. How do you actually close people on your training program? And I'm, I haven't put it together yet, but uh, maybe a Brian will invite me back because I, this guy, Burke Gulick, figured out, and I study sales trainers all the time, because basically, if people think you're telling them about sports psychology, you're doing it totally, you have to be selling them sports psychology. And the word enthusiasm ends with I-A-S-M, and that starts with I am sold myself, that little acronym. I, so you have to, sports psychology for me is the most exciting thing in the world. Peak performance is the most exciting thing in the world. 
there's nothing I'd rather talk about it than this. As a matter of fact, uh, whenever we end, you could call me if you have any questions. Call me for the next for two hours after we finish nine seven three nine eight five four one three eight. And tomorrow morning, you could call me between five a.m. and eight a.m. at nine seven three nine eight five four one three eight nine seven three nine eight five four one three eight. Now, the only people who are going to call me are the people who are extreme like I am. And those are the people I want to talk to. I'm not going to say call me tomorrow morning at 1030 in the morning because I want people who are like me. That's the people I want to associate with. The people who are really nuts. The people that I'll, I'll tell you a guy that's really nuts. Uh, Yogi Berra, there's a Yogi Berra Museum at my school, Montclair State University. The reason it's at my school is because Yogi Berra, um, lived in Upper Montclair, where my school is. So one of my students many years ago, there's a place in West Orange, one of these beautiful, beautiful wedding places called the Manor. So one of my students was at a wedding at the Manor and he goes into the men's room and he's washing his hands and Yogi Berra comes out of one of the stalls and he starts washing his hands. And he says, you're Yogi Berra, aren't you? He said, yeah, yeah, I am. And uh, see, Yogi Berra didn't know he was Yogi Berra. He, he had no idea. I spent a lot of time. He had no idea how other people viewed him. He just thought he was a kid from St. Louis. So he, the kid, my student, and Yogi Berra are talking about Red Sox Yankees baseball for about 20 minutes. And then Yogi says, hey, you got to excuse me. I'd love to talk to you more, but I got to get back to my daughter's wedding. <laughs> So Yogi Berra, while his son is getting married, is in the men's room talking about baseball. That's he loves baseball. You know, that's how much you have to love sports psychology and peak performance. You know, Dr. Gilbert, you mentioned enthusiasm, and one of the favorite success hotlines that that you've ever left is talking about. And, you're, and you've talked about sales. We have a lot of people on here that work in sales. And one of the things that you've referenced a lot that has been a game changer for me is the book, uh, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling by Frank Betger. And you, you have a challenge every year where you talk about reading that first chapter uh, in enthusiasm. Why is that chapter stick out to you so much? Good. Say that again, Brian. Why, why has that chapter had such an impact on you? That, that's all you have to know about sports psychology. Just read the first chapter. That's it, you know? And I hate to even talk about it because I can't say it better than Frank Becker said it. You don't have to read the whole book. Just read the first chapter and read it for 28 straight. Read it until it gets into your DNA. You know how when you heard a song and you like the song so much, you heard it over and over again until you knew it by heart? Well, this is it. You know, it's how actions change attitudes, motions change emotions, and movements change moods. The three most important words in sports psychology are act as if. Act the way you want to become, and then you become the way you act. And the first chapter is not about selling. It's about his minor league career and how he made it to the St. Louis Cardinals. So, you know, just get this book and, you know, and is awesome. for, the, for all the time I've been promoting that book, I finally found out that an old timer said, Gilbert, his name isn't Betger, it's Betchker. <laughs> you know, so I, I've been saying his name wrong. And you, all, you could go on YouTube tonight and listen to the first chapter because the whole book, the audio of the first book, of uh, the whole book is on YouTube. Hmm. Well, uh, last question they had. Dr. Gilbert, I'm having a hard time getting my sales guys to keep knocking on doors. How do I get them to be more extreme and work harder? Well, it's sort of like, um, I like speaking to athletes but my favorite group to speak to are salespeople, you know? So one, one time a guy in the Southwest says, you know, um, could I hire you, um, you, you know, to motivate my sales force? I said, of course you can. And he said, well, could you assure me that as a result of your seminar, my guys will sell more? And I said, well, it depends on the guys you hired. If you hired the right guys, they're going to do better. If you didn't hire the right guys. So, you know, there are some old time speaker came up with the 3%, 27%, 60%, 10%. Do you know that one, Brian? No. Okay. So in this, this is true in school. 
some of my students have become teachers and use it. This is true in sports. This is true in sales. Uh, this is true. Well, well, let's look at exploration. 3% of uh, people in the world are like explorers, you know? They'll go to places, they'll go to the North Pole and South Pole. Go, the 3% of the people will do things nobody ever did before. Like uh, when the first Nautilus place opened in South Hadley, Massachusetts, I used to ride my bike from Amherst because I was so into Nautilus. Nobody, nobody would go there because, you know, they just want to lift traditional weights. So uh, I was what they call an early adopter. So 3% of the explorers. Um, you know, 27% of the pioneers. After the explorers risk their lives and it seems safe, okay, then we'll go out and build our log cabin, you know, west of the Mississippi. 60% of the people are settlers. After the explorers went out and the pioneers went out, then 60% of the people, you know, okay, it's safe enough, we'll leave home. Okay, we'll go to the new country, we'll go to America. And 10% of the people will never ever leave home. So 33% of the people are the people on the cutting edge. You know, 27% of the people are the people like, uh, yeah, that seems interesting. 60%, you have to ram it down their throat and 10% of the people. So one of my students told me this, he said, Dr. Gilbert, you're not gonna believe this. He said, I teach English in high school. And I remember the 3%, 27%, 60%, 10%. <laughs> I had a big project and I told my students, that if you get in two weeks early, I'll give you massive extra credit. One week early, extra credit. You get in on time, no extra credit. And if you get in late, uh, you fail. So he said 3% of the people got in two weeks early. 20% of the people got in one week early. 60% of the people got in. So is this based on research? Not not really. But, you know, we want to be in the 3%. So um, basically, how do you hire people who are in the 3%? That is the secret. How do you hire the right people? And I, I've studied this, and I've come up with some pretty good strategies on how to hire the right people. But that's surely not the topic for tonight. Hmm. Well, we may have to may have to bring you back because I think that'd be a great topic to learn. Yeah. Because you know, if there's there's definitely some people on this call that I know that are explorers, they're on that cutting edge. And they're looking to be the trailblazers and, and take things to another level. Yeah. So if you go into our chat again, once again, I'd like to thank Fundraising University owner and CEO Mike Bahoon is the official sponsor for the Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program. And Fundraising University is looking to team up with members of our Coaching Matters community for three main roles. We're looking for franchise owners, corporate reps, and ambassador coaches uh, that are looking to increase impact, influence, and income. Coaching. If you click on the chat here inside of our um, or the link inside of our group chat, you can get more information at coachingmatters.org slash join the mission. Dr. Gilbert, man, thank you for joining us tonight. Wait, 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 wait. When you go to what's the last rock cost that you went to? Me? Um I saw Metallica three times in five days in Texas. It was unbelievable. Okay. So uh did they uh do an encore? Where they go off the stage and come back on at the yeah. end? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think they just played straight through. I think they just, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember if they left and came back, but I have. Uh, Brian, Brian, trust me, they did an encore. Everybody does an encore. So I have well, to do go. an encore. Looking I, for I, I, have to do, I have to do an encore, okay? Bring it. Okay. So one of the things we didn't talk enough about is that everybody has the ability and all they're lacking is a strategy. And that's our job because the way our educational system is, you know, we have the gifted and talented people. We're all gifted and talented. And people don't think they have what it takes. Of course you have what it takes. So I've come to believe that if I see somebody do something, I could do it too if I learn from the master how to do it. So I saw this, there's a dying art called the art of sideshows. If you, they still have sideshows with some small traveling circuses. So I went to a sideshow once and I saw a guy hammer a nail into his nose. I mean, I'm talking about big, smashing it, bang, bang, bang. And I went up to the guy and I said, you gotta teach me that. He said, where do you live? I said, I'm in New Jersey. He said, oh, you're in luck. I live right by Port Authority in New York City in Hell's Kitchen. So his name was uh, uh, Todd Robbins. And um, 
I emailed him 48 times. He never got back to me. Then on the 49th time, he got back to me. He said, well, thanks for being so persistent. He said, I was just testing you to see how much you wanted to learn it. So he invited me over to his apartment and um, he taught me how to do blockhead. So, but I don't do it the way he did. I did it my own way. So I got a piece of wood here and I have uh, an ice pick. Okay, you see ice pick. It's a real ice pick. It's not a fake ice pick. So, uh, um, so I thought it would be a pretty good trick if I could jam this ice pick into my nose. Because you have to understand my motivation. I, for the last two years, I've taught all my classes online. And do you know how hard it is to keep people's attention online? So I have to come up with things like the arrow and the ice pick that people cannot not look. You, you have to look at it, you know? You have to pay attention. So this will be my encore. Carolyn needs to see this, Dr. Gilbert. No, Carolyn doesn't need to see this. <laughs> This is something no father should let her daughter see. Okay, so tell me if I'm uh, in a good position. Mm, here we go, yep. Okay, okay. So I just want to end with this. We've been talking about extreme, but there are some things that are so extreme you shouldn't do because it could be career ending. It could be, you know, you could, if, I, if I actually did this, I could actually, you know, injure my brain. So I, I just want to, but I'm going to do it anyway, okay? Can you see it, Brian? Oh, yeah. Now you have to become even more extreme. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Okay, so uh, what is it? It's nine eleven. I'm going oh. to be available till eleven eleven at nine seven three nine eight five four one three eight. If I don't answer the phone, it's just because I'm speaking to somebody else. And then I'll be available between five a.m. and eight a.m. I teach at eight fifteen tomorrow morning. Nine seven three nine eight five four. And I'm not just doing this. I'm not just doing this to be nice. I'm eager to speak to you because if you call me tonight or tomorrow, I know that we're kindred spirits, you know. And I know you love this stuff like I do, so I want to meet you. Okay, uh, Dr. Gilbert, <laughs> unbelievable. Thank you. I hope, that was awesome. Guys, tonight, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow, 5 to 8 a.m., not 5 to 8 p.m., 5 to 8 a.m. Eastern time, 973-985-4138. We'll put that in the chat here so that everybody can get that again if, in case you guys want to reach out to Dr. Gilbert. Again, that's 9 to 11 p.m. tonight, 5 to 8 a.m. Tuesday. Let me, let me just add one last thing. The other thing I'll offer is if you have to give a talk and you're stuck for a story, I only want to speak to you a half an hour before the talk. So if it's an award banquet, you don't have, don't, don't call me a week before because I want you to tell me the situation a half an hour before because that puts pressure on me. So I'll come up with a story for you, I promise you, or something to do. So it's the same number, 973-985-4138. Now that comes with my lifetime guarantee. But there's one thing, since I'm 75 years old, you have to realize it's my lifetime, not yours. So, you know, don't get upset with me if you want my phone number 30 years from now. You ask Brian where I am, you know. I'm going to be in sports psychology heaven. The sports psychology hall of fame and heaven. Dr. Gilbert, thank you for being here, man. It's been an absolute perfect time. Thank you for showing up on Coaching Matters. Thank you, Mike Bahoon, for making this happen in Fundraising University. Let's dream big. Let's raise more. Dr. Gilbert, amazing. Thank you so much.